Welcome to Living Hope Online. I'm Annette. And I'm Jonathan, the lead pastor of Living Hope Church. Welcome, Welcome to, to Living Hope Church, Church Online. Online. We are Adrian and Maddie. And we represent the good old North. Welcome to Living Hope Church Online. We are Ewan and Cam from Peel and West PM. Welcome to Living Hope Church Online. We are Rousseau and Rianne from the South. Representing Castletown of Port Mary Church. Welcome to Living Hope Online. I'm Carol. And I'm Chris. And, and we're, we're from Douglas, Douglas AM. AM. Welcome to Living Hope Church Online. We are Matt and Grace Reese from, from Douglas, Douglas PM. PM. Well, welcome to Living Hope Online today. What a joy to be together on Sunday the 14th of June. Some great news this week. We've really seen God moving. And today we're expectant. I hope you're expectant where you are. I remember last week that Jonathan taught us, didn't he, when he talked about new wineskins, that part of our task on earth is to put a smile on the face of the Holy Spirit. And today that's what we want to do. We want to put a smile on the face of the Holy Spirit, don't we? We want God to move. We're expectant about what he is going to do. So we'd love you to engage with us today. Comment, where are you today? What do you sense God is saying? How are you feeling today? Just put some comments on the live stream and we'd love to hear from you. Let's make this an interactive experience between us in the community of God coming together to engage with our Lord. And you know, um, when Jesus and Barabbas were brought before the crowd um, and Pilate said, which shall I free? Those that were lifting up the name of Jesus were drowned out by a crowd that said, give us Barabbas, set Barabbas free. But the role of the church and our part is to make sure that that situation never happens again, that the name of Jesus is never drowned out. And we are going to declare this morning that there is power in the name of Jesus. So wherever you are, why don't you adopt a position of worship, of praise, jump to your feet, grab the family members that are around you, and let's lift up the name of Jesus and start how we mean to go on. There is power in the name of Jesus. Let's worship. i 
chain to break every chain to break every chain to break every chain break every chain break every chain when there's an army rising up there's an army rising up there's an army rising up to break every chain to break every chain
so powerful wasn't it why don't we pray together now Jesus there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved we stand in awe of you Lord God and this morning we're so thankful for your Holy Spirit the power of God that lives in us and changes us and gives us um, the fruits and the gifts to live out a life that reflects your glory to the world. And Lord God, we want to ask this morning that you would give us an encounter with your presence. Thank you, Lord, that your word says that those that ask will receive and that you love to give your Holy Spirit. And this morning, we are coming before you saying, Lord, would you send your spirit today? We don't just want to meet, we want to meet with you. We want to encounter you. We want to encounter your presence. So we ask you today, Lord God, would you be with us? Would you feel welcome in every home, in every life that is watching today? Lord, we want to meet with you in power today. Amen. You know that uh, when the Holy Spirit is moving, then we hear the voice of God. And one of the ways we hear the voice of God is through the prophetic. And we have people that move in the office of the prophetic. In Ephesians 4, it tells us that there are those who are gifted to the church and to move in the office and the gifting of the prophetic in order to equip us to prophesy. But the Holy Spirit enables every saint, every Christian to prophesy. And today we're going to hear a prophetic word from someone who really does move in the prophetic, Sarah Shaw. And Sarah has been listening to God and I believe she has something that the Holy Spirit has put in our heart, which is really relevant for today and is going to speak to us. So let's just engage. Let's listen to what God is saying through Sarah and we'll be responding in a moment. I feel that God wants to firmly establish a set of truths in our heart. And he gave me the words spared, not spare. Spared means to refrain from harming or destroying, forbear to punish, to spare an enemy, to deal gently or leniently with and show consideration for. We know that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And I feel like God wants to remind us of the wonder of our salvation and the magnitude of what the cross has saved us from and he is calling us to walk in that truth daily and as we do it will impact our every word and action you know the criminal barabbas when he was spared the punishment that he deserved and jesus went to the cross in his place we like him in many ways but when barabbas was released he was release back into the crowd. But I really feel the Lord is saying, when you were spared, I didn't release you back into the crowd. You were released into my open arms. And more than that, I adopted you into my family. You are my son. You are my daughter. And he is saying, there are no spare children in my family. And you weren't born with a spare set of arms and legs. As members of the church, you are called to be part of one body. And I feel this is a call particularly to those that know that they have been gifted by God, but they see others with a greater gifting. And you think it's right to be the spare, the spare worship team member or the spare coffee maker. But God is saying, no, I need a fully mobilised family. 
I got this sense almost that God was carrying out an audit to ensure that his stamp of authority was on the legal papers and on the hearts of those that he had saved out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of heaven. He is checking that our lives are stamped with the truth that we are spared and we have been adopted by God. So, Lord Jesus, I I thank you so much for the magnitude of the cross. Help your people walk in the truth of the wonder of that every day, Lord. I pray that your church would be fully mobilised. Lord God, that we would understand that there are no room for spares. You are calling every single child into action, Lord, to advance your kingdom, Lord God. And I thank you, Father, that you are securing that stamp of adoption on our hearts and that we have been spared through your love, through your kindness, Lord God. Father, mobilise us and send us out to be what this world needs, Lord God, and to show your love, Father God, in the nations. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a great word, isn't it? That's a powerful word. Um, Sarah talked about us being spared, not spare. None of us are on the shelf. None of us are without purpose. But each one of us has a part to play in the kingdom of God. And I was reminded as I was listening to Sarah of being in Switzerland. You know, the Swiss army has probably one of the biggest reserves, reserve armies in the world. And they can mobilize up to a million people in a very short space of time. Now, why can they do that? Because every home is equipped to mobilize a soldier. So everything that is needed to be mobilized is in their individual homes. And that's a picture that um, Sarah's given us here, that in each of our individual homes, we have all the equipment needed to be mobilized, to mobilize as the army of God. And we can respond this morning by um, coming before God and saying, equip me. I have everything I need for life and godliness in you. And if you would fill me with your spirit, we can be mobilized as the people of God to have an impact for the name of Jesus. So I'm going to ask us now to pray together as we respond to that prophetic word from God to say, we are not on the shelf. We are not spare, but each one of us has a special purpose in God's family. So let's pray this together. Let's pray this prayer as a response. Open your hands now if you might want to stand or even kneel as we pray and then we invite God to come and meet with us in our homes. Thank you, Lord, that I am not spare, but spared. I am adopted as your child in Christ. Thank you that adoption comes with the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. Mobilize us today with the power of your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come fill us, equip us, and overwhelm us with your presence. You are welcome. Come and do what only you can do. Amen. So as we've prayed that together, let's worship now. Let's turn that prayer into a worshipful response. And we're going to sing that song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And when we sing, you are welcome here, make that about where you are as well as where we are collectively. And then we're going to sing a new song, Spirit of the Living God. And one of the lines I love in that song is it says, come and do what only you can do. And that's what we're believing for this morning. So stand, kneel, be ready. Let's worship. i
tasted and seen at the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is
Spirit, we need you to come and do what only you can do amongst us. We're going to pray now. Let's pray together. This week has seen the protests against racism um, really grow, hasn't it? And it's moved us and it's exposed evil in our society. And racism has no place in our society or in the church. And we are so blessed in Living Hope to be able to celebrate diversity across our church family. But you know, as we celebrate that diversity amongst us, let's do what Jesus said, what Jesus commanded us to do. He said, do not neglect 
justice, mercy and faithfulness. Loving as he does, loving our neighbour, loving in the way that he loves us. So why don't we respond this morning to the Holy Spirit by coming before God in prayer and let's lift up those that are hurting in our culture and let's pray for the church. I want to pray for the church this morning that we can represent something to the world that looks like the words of Jesus, of justice and mercy and faithfulness and love and love for our neighbour. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to pray that we would have your eyes and your heart for the world. Lord, we want to pray that you would give us um, your sight, give us your light, give us your love for those around us. Father, we lift up those that are in pain at this time, those that have been hurt, those that are anxious, those that are in fear, particularly in uh, the communities of our black brothers and sisters, Lord God. And Father, we also lift up those that are feeling depressed or those that might have lost their peace in this time. And Father, we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would move in their lives. Lord, you would bring that peace that transcends understanding. You would bring a love, greater love than no man has, that love that you have for us. You laid down your life for your friends and you asked us to love others the way that you have loved us. And so, Lord, we do. We lift this situation before you and we ask, Father God, that you would be the peacemaker amongst us, that you would be the one who binds up the brokenhearted and brings power into justice and mercy and faithfulness. And then, Lord, I want to pray for the church. Lord, your word tells us that we are meant to be a letter from Jesus to the world. Literally, a letter written by your hand to the world. And Father, I want to pray that in the church, in the body of Christ today, there would be unity. There would be unity and diversity, Lord. But we would be a people of one purpose and one spirit and one mind. Lord God, we would be the light of the world and a light to the world. Lord God, would you come now by your spirit and build your church, Lord. Build us to be a message of peace and love and hope and reconciliation. Lord, help your church not to be bound up into division and aggression that the world can show. But instead, Lord God, let us be a model, an example, a picture to the world of what you have in the Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit, united and equal. And may we reflect that so that our letter to the world looks the way that you want it to. So Father, we do come before you now. Have your way among us. Lead us in the way everlasting. And we ask these things in the precious name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Great. Well, we've prayed there and uh, there's going to be an opportunity actually at the end of the message for ministry. So if you have a prayer need, you're looking for um, a breakthrough, a miracle of some form, then towards the end of the message, I'm going to invite us to respond and we're going to pray and we're going to lift up some of these things to the throne of the King and ask that the Holy Spirit come and move in power. Great. Well, now it's time to move on to family news. I can hear everybody going woohoo all around the island. Well, that's great. And today I want to remind us of a couple of things that are taught that are starting on Tuesday. So on Tuesday night, we're starting two equips, two very important equips. So that's going to be over four weeks and at eight o'clock. You're going to be able to join through a Zoom webinar our two equips. Well, the first one is flourishing in the family. Well, Flourishing in the Family, what's that? Flourishing in the Family is our foundation course for anyone who is new to Living Hope or is thinking of connecting into Living Hope. We cover what we believe, what our values are, what we um, stand for as a church. And also it's a great opportunity to ask 
questions and as a community to come together and to get to know each other better, even online. And various different pastors and elders will be involved in that. So we'll be doing that over four weeks. You can sign up. The links will be on the screen and on our Facebook page. Why is it important? Well, you know, we were never intended to be orphans. When we come to the Lord, we become part of a family and we needed to be connected in a family. We're not supposed to be lone rangers as Christians. So why not come and find out what the family do and how we love to welcome people into the family of God. So that's flourishing in the family. The second equip is our devotional life equip. Well, this is interesting because I have with my wife, Carol, an allotment. Actually, to be honest, Carol does 99% of the work on it. It's really her allotment. But anyway, one of the things that uh, we do is we have tomato plants. And we have these tomato plants in greenhouses. And when you water the tomato plants, you have to include some tomato food. So you don't just put water on, you add this tomato food into the water so that the plants are fully nourished and able to grow and flourish and produce fruit. And you know, that's a little picture of what our devotional life is. It's the food that makes sure that what we live out in the world is well nourished and well fed. It's the source of good food in our lives so that we grow properly and are well watered. So our devotional life is like tomato food. It's just a picture there, isn't it? That it means that when we're in the word of God and we're praying and we're seeking the Lord each day, then what we are living out is well nourished. So Matt and Grace are gonna kick that off on Tuesday, looking at our quiet time and actually doing a quiet time live. Then we're gonna look at what it means to pray, intercessory prayer with Rianne. I think Ewan's gonna lead us on hearing from God and then Adrian and Maddie will share about speaking in tongues. So why not get the tomato food in your life? and be well nourished and sign up for that devotional life. And then secondly, just wanted to say a plug for our life groups. You know, our life groups are buzzing at the moment. It's amazing reading the feedback and hearing how people are engaging in life groups. So I just want a regular reminder to encourage us. If you're not part of a life-giving life group, then get in touch. Get in touch on the comments for the live stream or message any of the pastors or elders and we would love to connect you in a life group. That's the heartbeat of the church at the moment. So there's a couple of great things for family news and have a great day. So now to move on to our offering. And to start with the offering, I wanna read just a couple of verses from the letter to the Colossians in chapter three, verse 23 and 24. It says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Now, do you ever get that feeling sometimes you, you go somewhere or you're part of something and you think, there's something more going on here. There's something that I don't know about. It, there's a bigger picture here. There's a bigger agenda going on here. And, and I just, don't see it all. Well, giving is something we do, you know, not for a man, but for God. Sarah's prophetic picture earlier said that we were part of something. Each of us had a part to play. And you know, our giving is serving a bigger picture. It's Jesus that builds the church. It's Jesus that's putting together the jigsaw of the church. And our part is just one small area. There is something more going on. There is something bigger. I think it was Gerald Coates who I first heard say, God is doing more behind your back than in front of your face. There's a big picture and our giving is something that serves the Lord in order that that big picture is put together. And in a minute, we're gonna hear a testimony of how God can work amazingly by piecing together the different parts. And how do we do that in our giving? Well, our part is first, we return what belongs to God. We return the tithe. We don't give the tithe, we return the tithe. It's God's in the first place. It's the test of our heart that we return to him. And then if we can, whatever we have on our hearts, we can give offerings and we can give offerings as a service to the Lord, to this bigger picture, to him, to serve what God is doing amongst us. And can I say as well that as we do 
this with our giving. If you are in need, if you have financial need, if in this current situation you find yourself in difficulty, please do get in touch with us. Contact a life group leader or an elder or pastor and we'd love to be able to try and help you. But for everyone else, let's give out of our heart. Now, if you are a visitor or you're tuning in to the Living Hope live stream, then please, if you're part of a local church somewhere else, that is the place to serve the Lord with your giving. So do that there. And uh, this is for our Living Hope family to give. And you can give through electronic means, either directly transfer into our account. The details will be up on the screen soon. And that's a great way to give. That's a helpful way to give for those that manage the finances. Or you can use PayPal. The PayPal details will be there. So let's serve the Lord. Let's serve that bigger picture and remember that from what we give, God is doing more behind our back than in front of our face. So just as we do give, and we're now going to see a testimony with Matt Reese interviewing Andre. And this is a powerful story that I mentioned in terms of how God has been working. And this is fresh. This is in the last few couple of weeks that God has done this. So as we give, let's be encouraged by hearing from Andre. Hi, my name is Andre. Um, I arrived in Yalaman in 2012. I'm originally from Portugal. I am a nurse at Nobles Hospital at the moment. I live here, have two daughters, and recently I became a Christian. I met someone online that was uh, saying that she was a Christian. So I had some curiosity to know more about that. It's some subject that is not approached nowadays. Me being a curious person, I wanted to discuss more into this. So this person, she's a friend of mine, she, and now she presented me with some testimony videos, which I started to pay attention, and I realized that there was people that have been moved or touched by something or someone, and they had changes in their lives, and that made me realize that something might be behind us. It's not just ourselves in this world. After all these testimonies that I've watched, after these people that I've seen come across on the videos, they seem to have a certain peace, inner peace. At least that was my interpretation. And I thought, this is something that I would like to achieve. And there must be a way for me to, to be like that. And the way would be to follow Jesus. Meanwhile, I have many, many questions from my past. To me, the world was purely physical, so there was not much room to consider anything else. And I also started to read some of Bible, and uh, which actually I had from a starter pack from Living Hope, and I came to the conclusion that this is not necessarily about the scientific information or beliefs, it's about loving Jesus, about the relationship with Jesus, and that made me, um, my mind much more settled, and I made this promise to follow Jesus. But now I was much, much more peaceful. I put myself in a frame of mind that I could tolerate many things. I could be patient. I could be supportive. Jesus is here to help us. And with his help, we can be so much better. It's great to share my story with you. Thank you so much. I'll see you. Well, that was amazing. And what a blessing to hear from someone who has encountered Jesus 
in these last weeks. And I've been watching the three minute testimonies going up on Facebook. You guys have been amazing, those of you that have put testimonies up, some really courageous testimonies, and they are bearing amazing fruit. Even this week, I heard an incredible story of family reunion just through someone putting up their three minute testimony. So do more of it. We want to hear more. We want to see more. You know, as I was talking earlier about the church being a letter to the world from Jesus, sharing our testimonies in three minutes, that can be a great way of doing that. So let's have more testimonies, but let's just pray over the offering. So Father, I want to thank you for your provision to us. Thank you for all that you have given us, all that you have put into our hands. Lord, I pray that everything that has been offered today by way of service to you would be well stewarded by us, would be invested as bread for food and seed for sowing for an increase of righteousness. Lord, help us to be faithful stewards that we might be a people that enjoy the true riches of your kingdom. And we thank you for Andre, we thank you for his testimony, and we pray, Lord God, that we would hear of many more who have come into a saving faith, into an eternity with a loving Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Well, we're in a series at the moment about the Holy Spirit, and it's been so powerful to remind ourselves all about the power of God in the Holy Spirit. And I wonder if you were wondering what I had on my t-shirt. If you can see that, it says extraordinary. And it's not that I'm extraordinary, but it's that God is extraordinary. And today I want to share a message on going from ordinary to extraordinary. And we're going to be in Acts 19 and verses 1 to 20. If you want to get your Bibles out, you can maybe have a look at that story. And first of all, though, I want us to just put ourselves, a bit of time traveling now, back into first century Roman times in the empire there and the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus is a celebrated city. It's a great city. It's the capital of the Ionian region. Um, And it's celebrated by all those who live in it, a spectacular city. And you know what else it is? It's the center of pagan worship. Right in the middle of the city, it's dominated by the temple to the goddess Artemis. This huge imposing, imposing temple with 170 plus white marble pillars and a statue of Artemis that nobody knows where it came from. It's pretty ugly, actually. But then it's not only a center of pagan worship, it's a center of commerce. Ephesus is known as the treasure house of Asia. It's the center for law. It's called an assized town, which means that Roman justice was meted out regularly in the city of Ephesus. It's the center for sport. There's great stadia there and the Pan-Ionian Games, the Olympics of the time are held regularly in Ephesus. And not only that, you know, it's a center for um, fleeing criminals because the temple of Artemis in the center of the city is a refuge for those criminals trying to escape justice. So this great city is the center of everything worldly, everything pagan. And into this place walks Paul, an apostle, and he encounters 12 ordinary anonymous men. And something spectacular happens. Something amazing happens in this encounter that changes an entire city and in fact, an entire region. And that change is all about extraordinary power. An ordinary situation is transformed into extraordinary power with the move and arrival of the Holy Spirit. And now Becky's just going to read exactly what happened during this incredible transformation. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who would practice sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So as you can hear from Becky, it, it's almost like a second Pentecost here. An impact on the whole region is absolutely extraordinary. The Holy Spirit's arrival changes everything. It changes everything for those involved and it changes everything for those that they encounter. I'm kind of reminded when I was a younger man, I went to see the first ever 3D movie. I think it was the first ever. It was Jaws. And we went to the cinema and we saw this 3D version of Jaws and it was incredible. It was amazing. There was one moment where a harpoon gun shot a spear out into the, uh, it felt like out into the audience. And you saw the whole audience duck as this spear came out towards the screen. And as we walked out of that movie, our jaws were dragging along the ground and we were saying cinema is never going to be the same again. It was an incredible <laughs> movie and everything that we had seen in 2D from Charlie Chaplin films when I was a younger boy, silent black and white movies, to this 3D experience. What a difference. What a transformation. And you, you know, that's a bit like what happens to these disciples in Ephesus. They move from living in 2D to 3D. And what brings about that change? Well, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings about the extraordinary power of life in Christ. As they realize that they only had part of the story and they receive the Holy Spirit, power comes, extraordinary power comes, and it changes everything. And that power is the power of life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Well, let's just have a think about the power of life in the Holy Spirit for a moment. We don't often reflect on this, but what Paul is saying is it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Well, when Jesus went into that tomb, the Jews believed at the time that um, the spirit of the dead hung around for about three days. So that was with the possibility of resurrection. But anything beyond three days only could be done by God. So Jesus's resurrection was a miracle that only God could have done. But not only that, you know, think about what it takes to raise a dead body. After three days, Jesus's body was in decay. Minutes after death, a decay process begins. It's called autolysis and the enzymes start to bring a decay to the body. So after three days, this body was decayed. But not only that, 
think about the state of Jesus's body. Jesus had been beaten. He had been flogged with whips that had metal barbs in them that tore the flesh off the back of his legs and off his back to the point that he could hardly walk. It's a process that I'm told is called going to hypovolemic, which basically is catastrophic blood loss. And the um, pathologist, Alexander Metherell, PhD pathologist, this is what he said. He said this, he said, after suffering horrible abuse with catastrophic blood loss and trauma, Jesus would have looked so pitiful that the disciples would never have hailed him as victorious conqueror of death. So let's just think about this for a moment. When the Holy Spirit begins to breathe life back into Jesus in the tomb, he not only brings breath back into the body, but he reconstructs flesh. He reconstructs broken um, muscles and torn ligaments and he pulls a dead body that had been decaying for three days back into a living saviour, into a saviour that as he walked along the road to Emmaus with those disciples, they didn't even recognise him. Yes, he had scars of his wounds on his hands and in his side, but the Holy Spirit had brought life back, life into a dead corpse. And why is that so amazing? Well, because Paul tells us something so incredible. This is where the extraordinary power of God comes in. He tells us that that same power that can do that is living in you and me. Isn't that incredible? The resurrection took some power to do, but that power is living in you and me today. Romans 8 verse 11, Paul said this, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, what? He lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Just catch hold of that church now. That same spirit that could reconstruct and breathe life into a dead body is living in you. That same power, that same incredible power is in us through salvation in Jesus Christ. And you know, when Paul encountered these 12 um, disciples in Ephesus, they had only the bad news. Sometimes people will say to us, do you want the good news or the bad news? Well, the bad news was the baptism of John the Baptist. It was good in that he was foreseeing the coming of the Messiah. But the bad news was he was telling you, you need to repent. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. You need to repent of your sins. That was the bad news. But there was no solution at that point. Repent because the kingdom of God is coming. That's what John was saying. And so these 12 in Ephesus were living in the bad news. And when Paul came, he gave them the good news of the story. He said, no, but Jesus has paid that penalty for you. He has died for your sins. He is the saviour, the Lord. He is the name in which you want to be baptised because you get the bad news and the good news, the solution that comes with it. And with that good news comes the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he laid hands upon them and that extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them and begun this work, this transformation of the whole region of Ionia and Asia Minor. And then we read in verse 20, Becky read it at the end there, that the result of all this, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely. And what did it do? It grew in power. So that's significant for us. Well, why is that significant for us today? Well, I think there are three lessons I can share with us from how those disciples took this extraordinary power and positioned themselves to see the word of God spread widely and to grow in power. And do we not want that for ourselves, for our community and for our nations? I think we do. So let's look at these three lessons of what can change the ordinary into the extraordinary with an extraordinary God. Well, the first was they had an extraordinary desire for God. In verses 5 to 7, it says in Acts 19, on hearing this, they were baptised in the name of Jesus. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. There were about 12 of them all. Well, there was no debate. They didn't say, well, let's talk about this for a couple of hours, Paul, and see what you're talking about. Instead, you just um, get the sense from the text, don't you, that they immediately threw themselves into it and said, yes, this is what we want. Pray for us, Paul. And Paul laid hands with them. No faffing, no delay. And the Holy Spirit, what did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came. These disciples had a spiritual appetite that teaches us something. And that appetite continues in this story because it says that they were taught in the philosopher Tyrannus's hall. And if, if you read in the Amplified Version, it says that this teaching went on daily between 11 or 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. And in the city of Ephesus, Tyrannus, who was a philosopher, his hall would have been fully occupied in the cool hours of the day, in the early morning and in the evening. But in the middle of the day, when these disciples were being taught, everybody went to sleep. Everybody went home. Commerce stopped and the whole city came to a slowdown because it was so hot. It was punishingly hot that all the sensible people went back to their homes. But these disciples were so hungry and the new disciples were so hungry. Their spiritual appetite for the things of God and of the spirit was so dynamic and rich that Every day they would go in the heat of the day and sit in the heat of the day between 12 and 3, three hours of listening to what Paul was teaching. And it says in the passage in verse 10 that this went on for two years. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. The spiritual appetite and hunger and desire for this extraordinary power amongst the disciples meant that all of the Jews and Greeks in the whole province were able to hear the word of the Lord. That's an incredible picture, isn't it? And, and you know what, church? Jesus responds to desperate people. If, if we are wanting to see extraordinary power in our lives, Jesus responds to desperate people. Think about it. The kneeling leper who came in front of the crowd and humbled himself before Jesus. Probably people were shouting at him, unclean, unclean. But still he knelt before Jesus and he said, if you are willing. And what does Jesus' heart say? It says, I am willing. And he heals him. What about the paralyzed man whose friends dug through the roof and put him in front of Jesus? What does Jesus say to him? He says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. You feel Jesus' compassion towards their desperate desire to be with him. What about the synagogue ruler who is esteemed and respected in society, who is widely honoured? What does he do? Well, he humbles himself before what many thought was just the carpenter's son. This synagogue ruler kneeling before the carpenter's son, so desperate because of his daughter, on death's door, that he humbles himself. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, do not be afraid. Just believe. I love the heart of Jesus. The bleeding woman who in that moment, that same moment, she fought through the crowd and touched the hem of Jesus's garment. Just, she thought, if I can just touch him, her desperation um, was so strong that she just wanted to grab a little bit at the hem of his garment. And Jesus, what does he do? He stops. He turns and he speaks to her and he says, daughter, be freed, be freed. Imagine those words from Jesus. Go in peace, be freed. And even the blind men shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy, have mercy. And the word records that Jesus had compassion on them. You get the picture. And there's many more stories. Jesus loves a desperate heart. He responds to a desperate heart heart. And when we read in Psalm 42 of the psalmist saying, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. It's not a mild thirst. It's a life or death cry. And that's the kind of desperation, because if we want to have extraordinary moves of God in our lives, we need to have extraordinary appetite for God. I remember when we were in Zambia, Stuart Nelson and I um, I've told this story maybe before, but we were taken to the service about six o'clock in the evening 
to share a message. And when we arrived at this hot hall, it was hot and uh, people had mostly walked there. We said to the leaders, how long have the people been waiting? And they told us that they'd been there since eight o'clock in the morning. Whole families had gathered, spent the whole day in the heat of the church because they were, their appetite for the things of God was so strong. And we were just turning up at six o'clock at the end of the evening. It was so humbling to see them there. And you know what? God moved that night. He moved so powerfully. I was talking to Cephas, the leader of the church there, and he told me that this was a couple of years later, that the church still talked about that evening. They still remembered us singing, he's alive, he's alive, as we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And you know what? I don't always see that appetite. I don't always see that appetite in us as the church, as saints. You know, I don't always see that desperation to be in the heat of the day for three hours just because we want to hear what the teaching is or we want to be part of where the spirit is moving or we want to just touch the hem of God's garment. And in Zambia over that weekend, there were 40 salvations, 40 moves of God. And are we desperate for his spirit today? Will we overcome inconvenience? Will we throw ourselves at everything that is available because we want to encounter the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit? Will we capture a little bit of the appetite of these Ephesus disciples? Because, you know, when we come to the feet of Jesus and we ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit to encounter his fruit and his gifts and his power, the promise of Jesus in Luke 13, 11 is that, even though earthly fathers know how to give, give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to us, though to those who ask him? No faffing, no debate, no waiting, no delay, just a willingness to give the gift of the Holy Spirit in power. And you know what? I'm going to say to us, be a keeny. We used to have a phrase. I don't know if you've ever had that phrase. You're just a keeny, and a keeny meant you were always so keen to be somewhere or to be part of something. It used to be a little bit of a derogatory term, but I'm saying be a keeny today. Be the first one to run up to the front to be laid hands on. I love those people that no matter what the ministry call is, when it comes to hands being laid on and the Holy Spirit, they just run to the front anyway. You see people who are so hungry and say, well, if prayer's going, I'm going to go and get it. And this morning, why don't we begin to position ourselves to say, I want to be a keeny. I want to have the Holy Spirit's power. I'm going to come before the throne. OK, so they had an extraordinary desire for the things of God. And secondly, they responded with an extraordinary honour. It says in Isaiah 11, verse two, the seven spirits of God. One of the spirits is the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is a fear of the Lord. And as Becky read earlier, the sons of Sceva, who were the sons of um, a priest, a Jewish priest, actually, they weren't just anybody. They tried to deliver a, an evil spirit and they did it um, without having the Holy Spirit. And it ended badly for them, didn't it? We heard they got chased out and beaten. And when the whole town heard of this, it says in verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. And other translations say the name of Jesus was exalted, was praised, was filled with awe, was magnified, was lifted up. An extraordinary move of God's spirit means an extraordinarily high honouring of Jesus. Easy for me to say. Jesus's name is held with extraordinary high honour. And, you know, that honour comes with a response, a, a worship, a laying down, a um, being seized with the fear of the Lord. Not an unhealthy fear, but a holy fear, a fear of the holiness of the name of Jesus, a fear of the power of the Lord, a fear of the Lord that brings um, the presence of God that makes the Holy Spirit comfortable because we're laying down our lives and anything that displeases him, we're setting aside. 
And we see this in the disciples here in Ephesus, because it says, it goes on to say in verse 19 that their response was that a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. They burned many valuable scrolls. Well, let me tell you that a drachma was the equivalent of a day's wages. So 50,000 days wages, and let me spare you the calculator. That's 137 years wages burned in those scrolls. And actually they weren't just burning something of value. They were actually burning something of their history, something of their culture. Because remember, Ephesus was a center of pagan worship and they had been brought up to revere this pagan um, temple and these pagan gods and these scrolls and sorcery and witchcraft was part of their upbringing. So in burning these scrolls, they were laying waste, not only to things of value, but actually to evil that had got into their lives. They, they were separating themselves. They were making a clean break, saying, no, the name of Jesus we're holding in such high honor that we don't want anything else to get in the way. The disciples were holding nothing back from their honor of the name of Jesus. And when we come to worship Jesus and we come to pray, we come with an honor that says, Jesus, you are worth everything. We hold you in the highest honor because we don't want anything to hinder our encounter with you. It's monetary value. It's sentimental value. It's attachment to us. It doesn't matter because we want to bring it before you, submit our lives to you and experience you with this extraordinary power. We want uh, to be a vessel that is clean, that you can use for special purposes, that the Holy Spirit can flow through and flow out to others. We want a well-nourished soul and a well-nourished spirit. And I wonder what are the valuable scrolls that we do hold on into our life that maybe just hinder us from experiencing the full extraordinary power available to us in the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe it's a relationship that we know is not healthy for us, but it's a scroll in our life, a valuable scroll, and we just can't bring ourselves to let it go. Or maybe it's a job that we've realized has come before Jesus in our lives and we need to just reorder our priorities and put Jesus first and regain that desperate appetite and desire for the things of the Spirit. Or maybe, you know, it can sometimes be something as simple as an attitude that we've allowed to creep into our heart and bring pride. You know, an attitude that we won't let go, an offence, we'll say, well, let them move first. Or I don't like the way the church is doing online worship and we don't engage in it. And that attitude is just holding us back. It's just a scroll in our lives. And maybe the Holy Spirit this morning is just highlighting that for us to say, no, if we want to come into the extraordinary power, we've got to hold the name of Jesus in the highest honor, in the highest honor. Or maybe we've said we don't speak in tongues. I don't speak in tongues. That's not for me, that's for others. Well, perhaps we need to humble ourselves and humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, if you um, want me to have this gift, then I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to hold your name in the highest honour. And I believe this morning that the Lord will respond to that. Jesus loves a desperate heart. And in Isaiah 66 verse 2, the prophet says this, these are the ones I look on with favour, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Amen. Well, if we want to come into extraordinary power, we need extraordinary desire for the things of God. And we need to hold the name of Jesus with extraordinary honour, the highest honour. And then lastly, these disciples, they lived with an extraordinary expectation. Again, Isaiah 11 verse 2 talks about the seven spirits of the Lord, of the Lord's spirit. And one of the dimensions is might, power, might 
and power, spirit of might. And in Acts 19 in Ephesus in verses 11 and 12, it says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Paul didn't do extraordinary miracles. God did extraordinary things through him. And this is a call to expect an extraordinary God to bring the miraculous. It's not a sign for a handkerchief ministry. (laughs) That's not the point. It's just a, a sign, a symbol of an extraordinary desire, a desperation to say, well, we believe we have an expectation of this amazing God, of this incredible Holy Spirit, that we're going to come and we're going to do whatever means we can to come and see if he will do something miraculous in our lives. I think of um, Julia Walton, who we saw recently with her family praying Um, so beautifully. And uh, I think there's a picture here of the family gathered around the table praying. And I remember Jeff and Karen, when they first moved to the island, in the early days of moving to the island, Julia had been diagnosed with a problem with her brain, a form of encephalitis. And um, it was such a significant and pronounced diagnosis that in South Africa, um, the x-rays of her brain had been taken to a conference of radiologists as a typical example of the condition that she had. And then when they came, moved to the Isle of Man, they had to go to Liverpool to see uh, an expert, a consultant there. And they just before they went to Liverpool, I think it was at a a Unite at the Villa Marina, they came forward for prayer. They brought their, um, their miracle request forward and we prayed with them and we didn't have any handkerchiefs, sweaty handkerchiefs, but we laid hands and we believed and they believed, they had an extraordinary expectation. And then when they went to Liverpool, the consultant, the expert in Liverpool, he looked at the x-ray and he said, I can't see anything here. I can't see anything wrong with this child. And Julia has gone on to be an amazing young girl and uh, she's a blessing in her church family and and the family have seen her come through and an extraordinary miracle took place. But you know, any healing is an extraordinary miracle. We've seen healings, I think we've seen more than 20 healings over the last couple of weeks when Connor McRae has led us with words of knowledge. And this is an extraordinary God and those that come forward with an extraordinary expectation see miracles. Does it happen all the time? I don't know. It doesn't seem to, but it does happen some of the time. And if we come with that desperation, with that expectation, with that faith, then maybe we can see an extraordinary miracle. You know, I don't think that people who were healed by Jesus compared the quality of their miracle. I don't see the leper going to the deaf mute man and saying, well, my miracle was bigger than your miracle. No, there's no comparison. Every move of God is a miracle by an extraordinary God. The ordinary has become extraordinary. Even with medical intervention, a miracle can come. The power of the supernatural combining with the medical can see a miracle of God happen. And we, church, should never relegate the Holy Spirit to the realm of the ordinary. The problem in the church today isn't that we expect too much of God. No, I, I, I don't think that's our problem. I don't think our problem is that our expectations are too high of what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I think there's a call on us today. Are we expecting too little rather than too much? I think if I was desperate enough, I'd take a sweaty handkerchief. But let's not go there. You know, if we're desperate enough, we will come before the Lord Let's not dumb down the power that's living inside us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside you and me. Let's not dumb it down. Let's not expect less of it. I wonder what's on our prayer list today. I loved it on Friday. We were praying for Douglas PM as a team. And the Douglas PM team said, uh, prayer request, we're praying for 200 people and 20 life groups. Well, why not? Why not? The extraordinary power of our God. Ephesians 3 verse 20, and Paul writes this. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. 
This is Paul writing back to those very disciples that we started with. And what's he reminding them of? He's reminding of them, them of you ordinary guys who had very little and were just cowering when I came to see you and you had just a glimmer of what God could do. Remember what happened. Remember what happened in Ephesus. Remember what happened to you. Remember what you were transformed. Now remember that this is the God who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or can even imagine. How's he doing that? He's doing that by the power that's living within you. You see, the context of that verse comes alive when we see the extraordinary things that had happened. And I believe God is challenging us in this Holy Spirit season, church, in this Holy Spirit series to say, what are we expecting? What are we believing for? What are we investing in today that may come tomorrow? What's on our prayer list? What are we praying for? Have we allowed our expectations to be dampened? Have we allowed our experience of our devotional life and of church to become ordinary? And are we forgetting that we serve an extraordinary God? I think we're being reminded we serve an extraordinary God. I love in Holland, the Living Waters Church in Holland, they were expectant for baptisms. So what did they do? They'd only planted two weeks before the lockdown and then the lockdown kept them locked away. But instead of just allowing things to become ordinary, they began to pray and expect for baptisms. And so they built a platform, a wooden platform. I think we're going to see a picture of it now. And this platform can go on the edge of a, a digger truck and be dipped into the canal, the local canal. And they built it with the expectation of being able to dunk people on this platform in the canal in baptism. And you know what happens? I spoke to Peter, the pastor there this week, and he told me since they did that, they've had 10 baptisms in a new church plant. 10 baptisms. They were investing in an extraordinary God. What's on our prayer list today, church? So I'm going to come to a conclusion now. 12 ordinary anonymous men saw an extraordinary God. And you know, the message to us today is an extraordinary God living in ordinary people can change the world. The Holy Spirit living through us, an extraordinary God living in you and me can change the world. That's what the church is. That's what the church is. The church is ordinary people like you and me with nothing special, but with an extraordinary God living within us. Let's begin to respond now. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Maybe just close your eyes for a moment just begin to invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. When we first came to Living Hope, 200 people gathered in Port St. Mary, and now seven congregations, and we are connected with nations all over the world. We couldn't have done that. None of us had the capability of doing that. None of us are that special. But an extraordinary God had an extraordinary plan that has connected us with nations all over the globe. And you know what? The word of God is spreading widely and growing in power. And as we come to an extraordinary God, say, fill us with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pray for us after we've had this worship song. But this worship song says these words. It says, a miracle can happen now, here as in heaven. So let's listen to this song. Let's engage with it. Let's prepare our hearts to respond and to believe that an extraordinary God is going to do extraordinary things right now where you are. the 
Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. The atmosphere is changed. for us now. I'm going to ask you 
Maybe you don't know Jesus today. Maybe you're stuck with the bad news of knowing that you're not good enough for God. Well, today, the good news is here as well. That in Jesus Christ, you have someone who's paid the price for you. You have someone who has paid the penalty for what you've done wrong. He knows you're not good enough, but today he is good enough for you. As you turn from your sin and you submit your life to him, come with extraordinary desire. Run, kneel at his feet. He wants to give you that sense of freedom, that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, and then to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The extraordinary God wants to come and make his home with you. If that's you today, why don't you say that's me on the live stream? Comment and we would love to send you a starter pack, one of our starter packs to help you come into faith and I'll pray in a moment for us. And for everyone else, maybe now you are thinking you want to come into the extraordinary, you want to be filled with the presence of God, the power of God. Well, it can happen in your home. A miracle can happen now. And you have a sense of a miracle that you're believing for. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe you're needing a breakthrough in something. Maybe you're wanting to um, recommit and come back into the family of God fully. Well, the Holy Spirit is here now. He's ready to come and fill you and change things. I'm gonna lift those things to us now. Pray for the miracle you need and expect his power to come and turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. So Lord God, I thank you this morning for this incredible story in Ephesus that we read about. We thank you for your transformation. We thank you that it shows us that those that are hungry for you, you do not withhold your spirit. And so, Lord, we come now and we ask you to move with that extraordinary power. Father, I pray for those that do not know you, those that are connecting with you for the first time today. Lord, I pray that you would um, bring that forgiveness of sins. I pray that you would um, turn the bad news into the good news solution of Jesus Christ. And Lord, you would send the gift of your Holy Spirit. And I pray for anyone who has connected with Jesus for the first time today, that Lord God, you would give them the courage to um, connect now with, with us, Lord God, and allow us to come and bring them into the family of God where they belong. And then Lord, I wanna pray for an encounter in every household right now. Lord God, and by an encounter, I pray that like when Paul laid hands on the disciples in Ephesus, that says your Holy Spirit came. And Lord, that's what I pray. I pray, Holy Spirit, you will come. You will come. You will bring um, your power, your extraordinary power into those lives. We love you, Holy Spirit. We long for you. We desire you. We, we want a shaking, Lord God, in our lives right now. Father, we ask you to forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us where we have relegated you to the realms of the ordinary. And we remind ourselves again today of how extraordinary it is that you are living in us and you want to um, do things in our lives and you, you want to help us to honor the name of Jesus with the highest regard. And Lord, I pray for every household that your power would come upon them now. And Lord, that the gifts of the Spirit would break out. Lord, the gift of speaking and praying in tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of faith would be um, present and poured out just as you determine, Lord God, just as you desire, each part fitting together. So Lord, we believe that you want to do extraordinary things through us. And that's what I pray right now, Lord God. And if a healing is needed, I pray now, Lord God, that your healing power would flow. Lord God, I pray for um, those that are um, needing healing in their mind, those that have depression, those that have anxiety. Lord God, I pray that you would flood into those minds. You would bring your healing to them. Lord God, you would bring comfort. You would bring restoration. You would bring hope. You would bring light. Lord God, you would bring complete breakthrough. Lord, I pray for those that are in pain, that all pain would go in the name of Jesus. And that Lord, your Holy Spirit 
would flow and bring extraordinary miracles. Lord, we don't need a handkerchief today, but even reaching through an online live stream requires that belief in something extraordinary. And Lord, that's what we believe today, that you are reaching in where there is physical ailments, that you would restore um, limbs, Lord God, that you would restore broken feet, Lord God, that you would restore strained muscles. Lord, you would remove persistent headaches. And Lord God, you would take away nausea and stomach pain. Lord, we ask for these things to be healed in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, the atmosphere is changing now. And uh, thank you for being with us today. And I pray that you've encountered something of God's presence. And as we conclude now, have a wonderful day. Please comment on the live stream or get in touch with us. If you need a starter pack, we'd love to start you off on your journey of faith with Jesus. If you've um, had a testimony this morning of something God has done, please also comment on the live stream or let us know. We love to hear those stories of what God has been doing. Or if you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit today, if the Holy Spirit's presence has been strong wherever you are, then let us know about that. And as we conclude today's service, um, stay in touch. Have a wonderful week. Join a life group and equip over the week. We uh, love being with you. We love seeing you. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. And that's the end of the service. I'm sure there'll be another song of worship um, from the McCrae's afterwards. But uh, let's just enjoy a great day together as family in the Holy Spirit. He's an extraordinary God. See you very soon.
So probably, perhaps let me do that again um, and just rather make that clear. That's the end of the service, but if you do want to hang around, we'll have a bit more worship. Okay. Well, amen, that's been a powerful morning, hasn't it? Well, I don't think it was too long in the end of the preach. <laughs> <laughs>